Welcome to Big Brother on the Couch. You don't have to be mad to watch this show, but it helps. This week, the housemates have had little sleep, lots of slop, and we've witnessed some bona fide, scientifically unequivocal telepathy. Fact. Another typical seven days in the world we call Big Brother, eh? And tonight we'll be analysing that world, and here's what's up for discussion. Every week the housemates nominate, and every week the housemates talk about it. We investigate the psychology of stabbing people in the back. Yeah, I'd rather nominate somebody and tell them afterwards. More body language analysis. This week our mission is to find out who's the leader of the pack. I thought we came onto the wrong show. I thought this yeah. is boot camp. Yeah, it is boot camp. Housemates spend months trying to get into the Big Brother house, so why are they always asking to leave? I'll ask the experts to find out. I was ready to walk out the other night. Everyone's going to have thoughts about leaving and going. Plus more diary room psychoanalysis as we go even deeper into the housemates' minds. Find out later how storytelling is a window to the soul. She wanted to cook. She wanted to stir and stir the meat. She was so stirred, couldn't get any stirred anymore. <laughs> oh, aren't you just dying to know what that all meant? Anyway, all that's still to come, but first, here's what happened in the house this week, packaged into a package that's precisely 2 minutes and 23 seconds long. For this week's shopping task, housemates must see how they cope without sleep. Over the next 50 hours, housemates will be allowed to sleep for just three hours collectively. Sorry. <laughs> Guys, no fading, no fading, no fading. Look crazy. Who's up for staying up? <laughs> Honestly. We've just boarded and the majority wants to go to bed. Fine, then it's bed. As Billy and Charlie broke a fundamental rule of Big Brother by discussing nominations, their nominations will no longer count. The housemates nominated for eviction this week are Billy, Carol, and Tracy. Okay, okay well, I'm walking away next time. I don't want to be involved in it. You don't have to be part of it, you know. Well, are you involving everyone, Charlie? So what? Who gives a <laughs> what you think? Who really? gives a what you think? think I care then, what you think. I had one discussion with Chanel, and he got involved. Why does he always get I care for her. So what? What's your problem? As a result of you failing this week's task, until further notice, housemates will be surviving on a diet of Big Brother slop. Edible stuff. Oh, how big is your ego? Do you not think that I possibly put you up? Because you get on my nerves. Shut up, me either! What are you going to do? Big Brother has noticed that you aren't in a happy place at the moment. That's it. I feel like going, frankly, but not not from a sad thing. I feel like it's my job here is done. Paper out says it. Psycho! Psychopathic! These things make me psychopathic. I'd like to put a request in to leave, please. And I can now reveal that the third person to be evicted from the Big Brother house is Billy. Oh. God, I'm shocked. Yeah, I mean, the shock was tangible, wasn't it, on Friday? Anyway, this year's housemates are more savvy than any other year, aren't they? Playing up to the cameras, and in some cases, they're actually saying what they think we want to hear. But a simple way to see through all of that um, is to analyse the housemates' body language, and tonight we're using the psychological equivalent of mind reading to find out who the leader of the Big Brother house is. And joining me now is psychologist Dr Peter Collett. How are you doing, Peter? Hi, Davina. So there isn't a natural leader at the moment. Why not? No, I think that's correct. It is, you know, something of a leader, this group. And I suspect that that's got uh, down to two factors. First of all, there's been no great need for a leader. And secondly, there's always an inherent risk of somebody actually stepping forward, putting their life on the line and taking the risk of trying to be one because, of course, they may get their head chopped off. Right, OK, there may be a challenger. Absolutely. Who would you think would be in the running for, for leader of the house? Well, before today, I would have thought that Ziggy was very much in the Yeah, running. me too. No? Well, yes, because if you think of the group as a kind of primate community, 
which it is in a sense. Mm. Um, he's collected a, quite a few women around him. Um, there, there's more than one, actually, who are sort of in his coattails. And that's, that's a usually a reasonable guide to who's the alpha in the group. Mm. Who else? Well, clearly there are two other contenders. There's not only Jonathan, who's always got a lot to say, mm. but there's also uh, Jerry, who's also a big contributor to all the debates that take place. OK, so what we did was we called all three of those guys into the diary room so you could examine them, mm -hmm. their body language, yep. and, uh, and see w what we could find out from that. What were we looking for to reveal sort of any kind of dominance? Well, I was interested in looking at dominance and submiss submissive signals in connection with a variety of things. First of all, spatial behaviour, how they actually entered the room and where they sat on the seat. Secondly, verbal behaviour, not only what they said, but how they actually organised their speech. And finally, body language, that is the way in which non-verbal behaviour provides clues to what's actually happening in their minds. OK, well, let's have a quick look at the three of them going into the diary room. Would Jerry, Jonathan and Ziggy come to the diary room? <laughs> Come down in there. Yeah, come, come. Do you want to come over? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. sure. Yeah. Hi, Jonathan. Oh, can't get That's so weird. I know. I mean, let's weird. talk about positioning because it just oh. looked awkward, didn't it? What was happening? Terribly there? awkward. I mean, it's a fascinating situation. It's a kind of micro experiment in a way because you know, there's only one place to sit. And so what does Ziggy do? Well, he has the opportunity to sit on the seat, but he, he decides... Doesn't. No, he sits on the, on the armrest. Uh, instead, what we have is Jerry, who's sitting there. He notices that Jonathan is uh, on the side, so he beckons him over and offers him a pla place beside him. He didn't do that with Ziggy. No, he didn't, and he could have. Yeah. Now, of course, they're all three arrayed together, but poor old Ziggy decides he's going to get into the front of the show... So he sits down on the ground. Then he recognises that that's actually an infantile place yeah, to be. it's a quite childish place to be, very. isn't it? Like a little So kid. he thinks... He goes to the only remaining place, which is a very awkward one, right behind everybody else. Now, this is a bit of a tragedy for him because it puts him effectively in the back seat of the car, a place where he's less likely to influence the events of the day. And what about vocal dominance? What are you looking for there? Well... As far as vocal dominance is concerned, we, what we thought we'd do is replicate the kinds of things that psychologists do. Quite often, the, um, you'll find that people who speak first in a group tend to work out to, as the leaders. Right. Whereas the person who speaks last invariably ends up as the person who does the photocopying. Right. And we thought, well, let's see if we can replicate this. Who is going to speak first in these little scenarios? Let's see what happened. <laughs> How are you all finding the Big Brother experience so far? Well, I was leaving up until ten minutes ago, so clearly very well. Is the Big Brother experience what you expected? Yes. Why do you think the group failed the sleeping task? Oh, now, that's what this is about. How is everyone coping on the slop diet? Badly. What is the mood like in the house today? <laughs> Mm. Thanks for the breakfast. The breakfast, perhaps. That. We liked it. the song. We enjoyed the song. It was fun. Do you enjoy chatting with Big Brother? Yes. Uh, yeah. Very yeah. much. What is it that you enjoy? Oh, that's a good one. There you go. As you go. How do you okay. plan to spend the rest of your day? <laughs> Doing tasks and eating amazing food that you're about to prepare for us. Have you enjoyed chatting with Big Brother today? Yes. yes. No, I've enjoyed Thank chatting you. with my fellow housemates. What was the experiment? <laughs> Jerry's so on to us, isn't he? We know that there's an experiment. Um, that's amazing, because Jerry was even going... Yes, he was. Now, what's, the first thing we notice is that Ziggy has absolutely nothing to say. Nothing. He's just not in the running, as far as the leadership stakes are concerned. But that's shocking, isn't it? It because is. It's I astounding. really didn't think he'd be like that. And then, of course, Jonathan is doing most of, taking most of the initiative. Yeah. But as you correctly noticed, uh, at least on three of those occasions, he's the first to speak, but that's because... Jerry's actually offering it to him. Giving him the power. Yeah, but there's another thing worth noticing, and that is, on several occasions, when Jerry speaks first, it's Jonathan who overrides him. And, right. In fact, interrupts. Interrupts him. And we'll be talking more about that a little bit later. But first of all, I want to talk to you about this brilliant thing, a verbal echo. Mm. Talk me through that. 
Well, one of the ways in which individuals show their respect for other people is by repeating either exactly or in some kind of paraphrase what they say. So if you were to say something and I repeated you, it would mean that I regard you as much more important than me. And we find that Peter, exactly you haven't there. done that yet. No, but I'm getting around to it. OK. OK. <laughs> <laughs> ah, brilliant. Let's have a look. <laughs> I thought we came onto the wrong show. I thought this yeah. is boot camp. Yeah, it is boot camp. He's small, but, but well defined. Perfectly formed. Perfectly formed. Give it our best shot. Best shot. It's yeah. a good start. It's a good start. Thanks for that. Thank you. Well, she never has been saying, but. She has never been. It's pottery. The arts. Pottery. Or class. something artistic would be pleasant. Artistic, yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's so amazing. It is. Fantastic. Literally, they're both just copying everything he says. But that's not the only way in which people show their respect. There are other ways in which they defer. Another way is by showing agreement. Right. Either, you know, somebody says something, the other person agrees, thereby conferring status on them. Right, OK, so let's have a look at that. Unlike the other tasks, someone else can't do their not sleeping for them. It's a cross between <laughs> um, the Priory and Harvard and a kindergarten. I don't think you can put it any better way than that. True, true. Rest. Moral. No, you're perfectly... No, completely right. Perfect. Couldn't say any better. We either have dysentery or complete blockage. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I, honestly, it's too funny to watch. And, and he's seeking agreement. He is. As well, it's like saying, confirm me as your leader, Absolutely. Please. They're falling straight into the trap every time. Ah, oh, God, it's so interesting. I love it. I love it. OK, um, what about other verbal clues? Anything else you saw? Well, interruptions is also another Ah, yes, sign. you talked about that earlier. We saw, we saw a nice, nice example of that. There's several other examples which are certainly worth watching. OK, let's have a look. And they follow the same pattern. Oh, sorry, yep. I wasn't expecting it to be that difficult, though, I have to admit. I thought it was more fun, fun, I fun. I thought we came onto the wrong show. I thought this yeah. is boot camp. Nobody was prepared to do the slip police and start you know, no. slapping people Not to wake up. physically getting hard yeah. with our own colleagues over no, it. No, that's abuse. Thanks for the breakfast. Breakfast, he perhaps. That. We liked it. the song. We enjoyed the song. It was fun. Yeah. Mm. He said, I love costumes. I love that. They're fun. It's fun. Yeah. Uh, the, the sheep bit was like, I, I remember... There should have been a carvery with mint sauce over the other side. We would have jumped higher. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, again, Jonathan, much more dominant there. Absolutely. On all these measures, Jonathan comes out as the alpha male. So where does that leave Jerry and Ziggy? Well, it leaves them in a rather difficult position because they're both vying for second position. On the basis of who's doing most of the talking, we have to say that Jerry is in second position and poor old Ziggy is right down He's at the bottom right of the pile. right down at the bottom of the pile. Yeah. Now, what about um, gestures of sort of discomfort or, yeah. or things like that? Because obviously they must be feeling, especially Ziggy, yeah. awkward. Well, if you certainly, if you look at what's happening with Jerry, now, he's in a, in a, psychologically in a very difficult place because he's doing a lot to reinforce Jonathan. He's, in effect, giving him the primacy in the group. And we can see that there's ambivalence in him because he does a lot of yawning. Now, we tend to assume that yawning has got something to do with boredom or with tiredness. But, in fact, it's got a completely different origins as well. It also serves as a very interesting signal of threat. And that's something connected with our primate origins. Now... For example, if you look at baboons, I mean, they do a lot of yawning. Why? Because it's their way of exposing their teeth, yeah. which, of course, are their main right. weapons. Now, we don't necessarily expose our teeth. He didn't there. But what we do is we replicate the same movement for the same, very same reason. So it's a very it's primal under... sort of... Absolutely. It's when he feels that he's t lower than he needs to be that he does all the yawning. Any other body language nuggets? Well, one of the interesting ways in which... Uh, power is communicated in groups is through touch. Essentially, the, you know, we tend to think of touch, as you did earlier, as a form of affection. But, in fact, look what's happening here. On the one hand, he's, he's massaging, massaging Jonathan. Jonathan yeah. That's a way of showing his respect. Yeah. But in addition to that, he's doing a very little bit of massaging yeah. on uh, Jerry, but he's mostly patting him. The first way is a way of showing that he respects Jonathan. The second is a way of showing that he deserves more respect himself. Ah, so he wants to be the next top dog after Jonathan, but he's not. He does. He's not. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter. <laughs> so still to come, we put nominations under a microscopic lens and then put it on your telly. See you in a bit.
Welcome back. You're watching a television which is currently showing Big Brother on the couch. Tonight's next topic for psychological debate is nominations. Don't you just love them? My first nomination this week is... Big Brother. Every move I've made today is there with his eyes like... And just think, there's no need for it. It's like regiment did, and we need to love to do this, and we need to love to do that. Sometimes I just think, well, that's unnecessary. I do it this way, do it that way, do it this way. I think I could probably have a, as good a conversation with a tin of baked beans. I find him very sly, but I also find him a little bit slimy. I don't like him. Well, this is quite what you would call snappy. I'm just rude. You don't have to be rude to people to show that you're real. Do you want to patronise me anymore? <laughs> OK, Johnny, you now have to talk about the psychology of nominations is psychiatrist Dr Az Hakim. So, Az, how are you doing? Hello. Um, now, listen, each week the housemates say, oh, we hate nominating, but is this really the case? No, of course they don't no. hate it. No. They know full well what's expected of them. They know, they, they know what the show's like. They've yeah. seen eight series of it. They've signed up for the role that, that is of being a housemate, and the part of that role is the nominating process. Exactly. And so to, what is behind the psychology of nominating? OK. Well, um, if you divide the nominations into three stages, you've got the, the bit running up to the nominations, which I'm calling the prequel. You've got the nominations itself, and then you've got the bit after the nominations, which you can call the... Sequel. Sequel. Yes. So in the, in the prequel, the, in the bit running up, you see um, housemates trying to do one of two things. Yeah. Either trying to increase their favourability in terms of how the other housemates see them, yeah. or trying to decrease their competitors' favourability. And then the nominations themselves, there's a whole raft of psychological things happening, and then the sequel, whatever happens after the nominations have been announced. OK, so let's move on to nominations themselves. Now, you chose um, a couple of people to look at today. And that was Charlie and Chanel. Um, so why did you choose those two? OK, well, if you think about how we communicate with people, we communicate in, in three ways, by speech, by body language, but also by unconscious processes that happen when we interact with each other. The housemates have been forced, by the very virtue of being in the house, into a, into a regressed state of paranoid functioning. And when we are in this regressed state of paranoid functioning, we, we function... Um, quite a lot by projecting aspects of ourselves that are, that are unacceptable, aspects of ourselves that are unacceptable or undesirable onto other people. It's an unconscious process, so we don't do it on purpose or we go out of our way to do it, but it happens unconsciously. And we, we, we see in other people aspects of ourselves, our bad traits, as belonging to other people. So we so, call this projection, and in an interactive process, it's called projective identification. So say you're talking... Um, having a bitch about somebody and you're saying all these nasty things about them, you could actually be saying those nasty things about them and actually be it's you. Yes. Yeah, be yes. them yourself. But not, but not aware that it's actually about you because it's, it's out of your consciousness and you've put it onto someone else. Well, let's have a look at what they project. OK. I think maybe Billy. The thing is, everyone wants to sit around talking behind his back. I'm the type of person I'll go up to him and say, Billy, why have you been talking about me behind my back? If you've got something to say, say it to my face, OK? Charlie. Shock. If somebody looks nice, she'll walk around in a leopard skin thong or something just to make sure that she gets more attention than somebody else who looks nice. And just think there's no need for it. Yeah, I mean, I suppose with Chanel. With Chanel, um, Chanel, she, she's talking about Charlie and she's saying that Charlie's, you know, changing her outfit lots of times, she's wearing skimpy clothes. Hello. She's, she, she, she's trying to get attention from other people. These are things that she could actually be expected to, to be wanting herself to be like, but she's, she's identifying them in, in Charlie. And not only is she envious of them, but she's also despising Charlie for having these aspects which actually belong to herself. So this is an example of projective identification. And what about Charlie? I mean, why are they doing that? Charlie, Charlie could be describing herself again. Yes. The backstabbing, the bitching, the two-faced talking. I mean, I mean, she's talking about herself, but she's not aware that she's like that. She's but... projected it all onto Billy, and it's located in Billy for her, and she's attacking him for aspects which actually belong to her. If you're projecting it onto somebody else, can you get rid of it from well, it... yourself? That's, that's the unconscious sort of uh, reason for doing it, but it, it doesn't really work that well, does it? And we see in the house it doesn't really work that well because, you know, people notice that actually it's, it's about you and it, it comes back to you eventually. So I won't stop projecting all my nasty bits no, onto other people this week? It's not a good move. No. OK. So Brian, next, what's next? What's he doing? Brian. Well, Brian, Brian is, is um, coming across as being quite aggressive and that's because he feels that he's under threat. So his, his aggressive, defensive stance is, is a reflection of how threatened and vulnerable he feels, I think. OK, well, let's have a look at Brian nominating. Okay. I'm going to 
to say Jerry. He makes everything really serious. He talks about museums and art and stuff. It's like, oh, I can't deal with museums and art. Do I look like a museum and art person? No. <laughs> I feel a bit sorry for Brian there. Well, the thing is, Brian, I think Brian's aware that he's not the brightest housemate, perhaps. I mean, I think it's fair to say that. I mean, this week he found out that, that women defecate, I think, for the first time. And... Do you mean poo? Yes. Because that's what the rest of us call it. <laughs> yes, poo. I think it's a posh poo. <laughs> it's a posh poo. <laughs> um, but... So, so with Brian, he, he's identified Jerry as being someone who's quite intelligent and articulate and, and, and he feels very threatened by that and all this sort of talk of art and museums and he, Makes he, him he's insecure. saying, I, I'm not an art and museum type of person, so he feels very threatened by that. So, so as a response to being threatened, he becomes quite defensive and quite aggressive. Do you know what my mum said? What did she say? She said, you can learn information and educate yourself, but you can't learn to be kind. You need to get your mum in here, See? into the house to tell yes. Brian. Yes, yes. Because Brian's a kind guy, isn't he? He's a nice boy. He's a nice boy. Um, OK, so final stage, the sequel. sequel. Yeah. Talk me through that. OK, so bound up in, in, in housemate etiquette is that um, when the names are called out, the, the people who've been nominated, uh, housemate etiquette uh, dictates that you should look as if you're not flustered and almost as if you were expecting your name to be called out. This, of course, is in stark contrast to what actually is happening in your internal world, which is a dread of being called out, and actually the narcissistic disbelief that anyone could A, dislike you, mm. or B, even nominate you. Mm. So when you do hear your name out, there's this huge narcissistic wound to your ego, which then, you know, there's this cascade then of being hurt, being upset, being angry, and then re retaliatory towards the group, and a bit paranoid as to who, who nominated you. That's got to really hurt as well, yeah. hasn't it? And the other housemates who, who, who haven't been called out, they're overwhelmed with this sense of, thank goodness it wasn't me, but etiquette dictates that they have to show some cursory concern for that. Well, what happened to etiquette with all the discussing nominations this week? Well, this week was really interesting because the... the, 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 the rules and the foundation of Big Brother, the, the bedrock that, the, that holds it all together is that the nominating process is secret and it's confidential. Yeah. And that's the... And it's, it's the rules and the foundation that are something to sort of keep... The, and it's the, the a fundamental together. rule. It's a really well, it, important it, well, it, one. It protects them from what is otherwise a quite maddening, paranoia-inducing experience of being a housemate. Yeah, it would make you feel awful if you knew every week exactly well, who was what happened this you. week when Big Brother pulled the rug under their, under their feet was that what was normally kept secret and confidential was now in their faces. So it was inevitable that a row was going to erupt. Yeah. And what, the, what was really behind the row was that, uh, for the first time, they were being faced with their own destructive aspects of themselves, which they were normally shielded from by the confidentiality of the nominating, which they were now seeing these destructive aspects of themselves in each other and being terrified by and attacking in each other. Do you know, I wouldn't go in that house for all the tea in China. It's hard in there, isn't it? I mean, the nomination process in itself is a very hard experience for somebody to go through. They love it. They love it. <laughs> Thank you. Please come back, won't you? Thank you to. very much to Az. Thank you. Still to come, some results from the psychological experiment we did on the housemates. I'll see you then. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Big Brother on the couch. It's experiment time now. And on Friday, the housemates were psychoanalysed in the diary room. And the woman who devised this week's mind-bending test is clinical psychologist Cecilia De Felici. Now, so what was this week's experiment and what was it designed to tell us? Well, what we wanted to do this week was to get all the housemates to tell us a story. But not, not any old story. We wanted to get them to tell us a story that would reveal something about their internal world, a little bit about how they relate to themselves and also how they relate to the other housemates. So how did you do it? Well, what we did was we gave them some cards. And on the cards, we had pictures of all the housemates. We gave them another set of cards, which had a location, which was from in and around the house, and another set of cards where they had an object from in and around the house. And they had to take one card from each of these sets and make up a story. So with one person, one location, and one object. OK, now, obviously, lots of the stories are very interesting. Um, and we've picked, as our first example, Chanel. And her story was she chose Brian, the storeroom, and a can of cider. So let's have a look at her story. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a very tall, 
a young man called Brian. And one day, Brian was in the Big Brother house, dreaming and dreaming and dreaming of cider. Brian was banging and banging and banging and banging on the storeroom door. And then Brian looked up to a green ray of light, meaning that he could go into the storeroom. Ooh. And then Brian went into the storeroom and on the shelf was his favouritest ever cider. So he ran towards the can of cider, but the cider kept getting further and further and further away until Brian ran so much that he finally reached the can of cider. OK, OK. I sort of thought that was quite a funny story until she got in... Brian got into the storeroom and then it got further and further away and I was thinking, oh, OK, now it's getting kind of deep. What did, what did all that mean? I think it's very interesting because I think this story is a little bit about Chanel and where she is at the moment. Um, here we've got Brian and he's banging on that storeroom door and Brian get... wasn't an obvious choice for her to pick as well, a I housemate. Think, I think the reason why she chose Brian is because Brian is a very nice person. He's very warm, he's very caring, he's got a lot of emotional intelligence. These are all things that Chanel values in him, but also right. in herself. Right. And I think this links very nicely with her story, because yeah. there's Brian. He's desperate to get this thing he really wants, which is locked away in the storeroom. And he's banging on that door, trying to get in, and there's no way he can get in. Is anyone listening to Brian to try and get in to get this thing he he really wants. Now, I think this is a metaphor for Chanel. I think what the story represents is like the treasure chest of winning Big Brother. And the thing, the cider becomes this thing that she really wants, which is celebrity, fame, success, all of that. But nobody's listening. No one's opening that door for her. And then this beam of light comes down and magically transforms. Brian into the storeroom to get at this cider. Now, this beam of light is like, well, it's like a spotlight, isn't it? It's like being in the limelight, getting all the attention. Now, if Chanel can magically get all that attention for herself, she might get a chance of grabbing hold of this thing, this cider, which I think is the success, but it's like she's so close to it and yet it's still so far. And I think this is her story. She's in the Big Brother house now. She's worked really hard to get there. She's come a long way, this girl, from where she started. But is it possible for her to really get hold of this thing and win it? You wouldn't think that it might be about Ziggy, the sort of unattainable, like, she's kind of worried about it or she's trying to reach him or...? I think that... I think Ziggy is wrapped up in this a little bit because Ziggy and Chanel form this celebrity couple. They're a celebrity right. couple in the house. Right. Now, she's... Her relationship with Ziggy is very rocky. It's, they're so on and off, this yes. couple. But I think that they know that we part of their... We want them to be on. No, we want them we, to be we're on. We're romantic. We're so wanting we them to be together. Yeah. But I think that they both know that so much is invested in the fact that they're a couple. Mm. Now, if they leave the house as a couple, mm. that's real celeb stuff. That's Victoria and David walking down the street together, which is part of their fantasy. Without that, yeah. what has she got? Mm. So I think that's why it feels really unobtainable. It's like a spiritual thing to her, isn't it? The light coming down. Exactly, but she's very yeah. resourceful and she's very hopeful because in the end, Brian gets that cider and he gulps it down and it's like her saying, I might get this thing, get refreshed, and my whole life might change. Or she might get quite drunk on the cider. And fall over. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's move on to our next one. Um, so we're going to have a look at Charlie, who chose Nikki, the kitchen, and cider again. They're obviously yeah. gagging for alcohol, they aren't like they? like a drink. Let's like have a, a look. In comes this four-foot-tall girl called Nikki. I ask myself, who is this girl? Who is she? She seemed very, very nice. As I say, looks are very deceiving. She loved a can of cider, if I must point it out. And always in the kitchen, she wanted to cook. She wanted to stir and stir the meat to it. So stirred, couldn't get any stirred anymore. Then a guy arrived in her life. Big guy, spiky hair, blue eyes. His name was Liam. Made her very happy. A another girl called Carly got in with her and that a really nice girl. They become closer. At the beginning, Carly couldn't stand Nikki. So... Charlie become, should I say Carly, sorry, become to understand Nikki, and they become friends. Well, that wasn't that thinly veiled, was it, there? <laughs> Charlie, hey, Carly, Carly, Charlie. And I loved all that stirring oh, and stirring, and she went, meat! Yes. What's that about? 
Well, I think here we've got um, Charlie and her conflicts yet again. Mm. She really diminishes Nikki right at the start. Hello, four foot tall. Four foot tall. And she's saying, look, this girl looks really sweet and innocent and lovely, but underneath she's not. She's mean and sarcastic. And I think, again, we might say that this could be a projection because we know that Charlie looks great on the outside, doesn't she? But inside, sometimes we see parts of Charlie that aren't so nice. But then she goes on to say, when Nikki gets this guy and this and this cider suddenly she's a different person and again we could say this might be a projection because we know that when charlie gets a drink and a guy she's a different person oh God, she, she needs a guy for affirmation so, yeah. in that house none of the guys want to be with her she really does want a guy and i think that this, so this is a little bit about her jealousy but it's also a little bit about her need to have an ally she hasn't chosen her allies very well no shabs evicted billy evicted but what's really interesting about this story is at the end you notice that she got the Charlie Carly thing muddled up. Now that's a parapraxis, that's a Freudian slip. So we start to see that she's really talking about herself. Mm. And what's interesting is at the start of the story she really hates Nikki, but at the end of the story she likes her. Yeah. Now this tells us a lot about Charlie's emotional development. It's like she's stuck in adolescence. Do you remember when you were an adolescent? You either really loved your mates or you really hated them. Yeah, and you could do both in one day. Absolutely. You? You and you start oscillate. the day, I thought, I don't know, and then you come home and go, I love this. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you, you oscillate between the two. It's like you need your parents and you love your parents, but if they don't do what you want, you hate them. Now, this is a very adolescent way of behaving. She looks like a grown woman, she looks like the real thing, but emotionally, I think she's really stuck at a much earlier stage of development. Well, I was talking about her today, you know, and, and we said, you know, she's 21. I mean, I forget mm -hmm. that Charlie is that young. Yeah, she's very young. she's so full of kind of bravado. And neuropsychology tells us that our brains remain adolescent until we're about 25, so we can carry on having hissy fits until we're 25. Or, my case, 39. <laughs> But she is very... I think what we're saying here is that she is emotionally yeah. quite undeveloped, and yeah. that's why we see so much of this explosion going on. She loves, you know, somebody one moment, she hates the next. Billy, she really hated. Um, Suddenly, best friends, and then he's out. I'm sure we're going to be seeing a lot more of that this a week. A lot more of yeah. that. Thank you very much. Cecilia. Great. We unearth why the housemates keep asking to leave the Big Brother house. See you in a bit. <laughs> Welcome back to Big Brother on the Couch. Now, back in January this year, Big Brother started a two month tour of Britain looking for a new batch of housemates. And after six months, of interviews, waiting, going into hiding, more waiting. The chosen ones finally made it into the Big Brother house. So why the blooming heck do loads of them start talking about leaving literally just days after they've arrived? <laughs> Everyone's going to have thoughts about leaving and going. I just want to go. No, don't start. No, you don't. Look, I was ready to walk out the other night. What is the, the procedure if you did want to leave? Well, I want to go home. I don't know if you think I could do this anymore. It's too late. Just kind of just can't be bothered. I just think I want to go home. Loads of people have got to stay with you. Right, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm leaving the house. You know? I just want to go home. I'm sick of the show. I've had enough of that, and I thought well, I'd never give up, but this is just taking the. People will threaten that probably more often than they mean it, even. OK, so joining me now to talk walkouts and threats of walkouts are psychologist Professor Geoffrey Beatty and cultural commentator Natalie Haynes. So, Natalie, I'm going to start off with you. Um, why do so many housemates talk about quitting so quickly? It's, I find it supremely annoying. I think it's a culture shock thing. I think the audition process is really well designed to find people who are very extrovert and who, you know, they tend to say the same things, which is, I'm the centre of attention of my social group. Everyone always says I'm the, you know, life and soul of the party. Uh, and <laughs> famously, I'm not fake. I'm not too fake. Yes. If I've got a problem with someone, yes. I just, I'll just tell say them. it. Well, that doesn't necessarily equal everyone having a lovely time in the same no. enclosed space. Everybody arriving, everybody <laughs> saying it like it is. Exactly. So I think what happens is they.
they all start out going, brilliant, I'm the centre of attention in my world, I'm going to be the centre of attention in everyone's world, and then mm. they get there and go, what? Yeah, there are rivals, doesn't quite work like that, and it no. all gets a bit yeah. traumatic for them. And I think they end up, a lot of them end up very bored. It tends to be, not exclusively, but it tends to be the older ones who actually do leave. And I think the house tends to split into children and parents. Yes. And the people who start off going, oh, well, you young people make a noise and blow whistles, we'll, uh, you know, clean up after you. That gets really old really fast. Yeah. So I think they just get bored and grumpy. Although why they don't see that will happen before they go in, as opposed yes, to after. Exactly. Couldn't tell you. But quite clearly, they say they watch the show, but they can't have watched it for very long. Uh, I think they watch highlights. Maybe yes, exactly. Go, exactly. Oh, probably yeah. like yeah. it. Oh, looks person. great fun. You couldn't. <laughs> um, so, Geoffrey, how can you tell if somebody really wants to quit, or whether they're sort of doing it for strategy? Well, you, you know. can't take what they say at face value. You have to go kind of beneath the surface. You can listen to what they say, listen for their explanations, and you have to kind of analyse the psychological motivations behind the whole thing. And, of course, from my point of view, the big giveaway is whether what they're saying connects to their body language or not. Their unconscious signals, which I think always give them away. OK, well, let's start off by looking at some housemates who've talked about leaving. And the first one who actually did leave actually was did go, yeah. Leslie. Yep. Um, so let's have a look at her request to leave. <laughs> I'm ready to go home. I am more bored than is acceptable to me in the sense that I have better things to do. And I actually think this is a very good time for me to back out and let them get on with that. I mean, obviously, in hindsight, we know that Leslie did genuinely go, but, I mean, how can you tell I could from... have predicted it. Yes, you yeah, could, I could have, have predicted, predicted it. it. And how could you have done that? Well, first of all, because her <laughs> speech is really direct. There's no messing about with probablys or maybes. Very, very direct speech. And I would have predicted it on the basis of one thing, yeah. which is when she says it's a good time for her to back out, she does this unconscious, iconic gesture when she's saying it. Now, you can't fake those kind of gestures. And what's really interesting is the gesture actually precedes the speech. Right. So what ha is happening is the brain sending a message to the motor system saying, move, make the image, and the brain sending a message to the speech system simultaneously. And that's why the movement slightly precedes the speech. Nobody could fake that. So I could have staked my house on that one, actually. And, and any, any other things that she's well, doing? Well, it's also really interesting that, of course, leaving the house for these people is a bit a momentous decision. And look at the way the iconic gesture goes into a self-adapter at the end. And an yeah. unconscious lip bite. And also notice her blink rate. Yeah, she's manically blinking. Manically bri blinking. She actually blinks one time a second during this period. So, in other words, Why? she's showing a very strong negative emotion. She knows the consequences of what she's decided to do and the emotional response kind of goes along with what she's saying. So everything's in perfect synchrony. OK, well, let's move on to um, Ziggy and Jonathan. Now, earlier this week, both of them said they wanted to go. So, Natalie, what was going on there? Did either of them actually mean it? Really, no, it was time, weird. Do you think? It was weird because they went in opposite directions. So uh, Ziggy goes into the diary room, doesn't say anything to anyone else, and says, I think I might want to leave uh, because Charlie called me names. And what he's essentially, I think, doing is realising, uh, perhaps a little late in the day, that the chances of winning an argument with Charlie face-to-face -face are roughly the same <laughs> as hell freezing cold and yeah. <laughs> and the devil skiing to work. So it's like he can't bear it for another second, just goes, right, I'm not arguing with you anymore, but then he has to go and finish it somewhere else and just say, I was right, to somebody. Whereas with Jonathan, that's just extraordinary. He goes into the diary room and goes, I think I want to leave. I promise not to tell anybody. Walks out and with, it's within, like, two seconds. <laughs> bah! I might want to leave. And I think what he is doing is trying to persuade the rest of the house that they can't cope without him. He's kind of going, imagine how awful it would be if I left. I might leave so that they will all go, oh, we love you, don't leave. Yeah. But I think it's a mistake, because I think what happens is people go, you might leave. I better not be friends with you anymore. Yeah, you distance, might leave me. Yeah, I'm going to distance I myself they're... from you in case you desert me. Exactly. They, yeah. they now feel they can't trust him to be their ally. Let's have a quick look at Jonathan saying he wanted to leave this week. I feel like going, frankly. But not, not from a sad thing. I feel like it's my job here is done. I think I'll go to bed tonight, I'll wake up in the morning, and I'll come and see you. I've got, a, hopefully, someone waiting for me out there. I want to go home and see him, and I want to start my life tomorrow. I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, that's why. Personally, I would stick it out. Stick it out. All right, let me ponder it. I, I'm completely confused. I've got a blender in here. Just going to embarrass myself and say, could you put it up, put up a bit? Of it? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I don't get I don't get that massive massive U-turn from Jonathan. Jeffrey help me. Okay, there's a number of critical signals to look out for. The first thing is it 
in terms of emotion, it's a big negative thing to kind of leave the house. But when he's saying it, his face starts to show this micro-expression of joy, which he tries to cover up by lowering his head and adopting a very serious tone. So that's the first giveaway. So, so even when he was saying it, even when he was somewhere it, in his somewhere head... Somewhere he thought, this, this, to me, this just didn't strike me as real. Right. And then what he's telling Big Brother is he's going to sleep on it, wake up in the morning and give his decision. But there's a wonderful little uh, signal right. just about to come up here. When he says all of that, mm. he does this kind of tongue-in-cheek thing. And it's almost like spitting the dummy out. It's like a symbolic rejection of something. So what will does you, that mean? Well, you put the tongue out, but he's trying to conceal the whole thing in his mouth. It's almost as if he's distancing himself from what he's actually saying there. You so see, he, he sort of puts the words... Uh, it, it's, it's his signal that he's kind of distancing himself from what he's saying. So although he's telling Big Brother he's going to sleep on the decision, he's actually made his mind up. But he I, made such a brouhaha when he came out as well, oh, of course he? he did, but, but that's exactly what he wanted. Jonathan is one of the two biggest narcissists in the house, and what, uh, he, what he got was that adulation when he came out, them all around him, applauding him, applauding laughing... Applauding him! Applauding for him! For his decision! Brian, exactly. Hello. Real oh, tears as well! Bad. Charlie crying! Exactly, exactly. A narcissist will do anything to reopen their narcissistic supply, any attempt to elicit that kind of response. He got the response he wanted. But are you with me when I say that that will only work once? It will only work once, as extremely as that. I wouldn't be surprised if he tries it again, by the way. Yeah. Because Do you think? he will use any method to get the kind of adoration he expects from those around him. And what do you think will happen then? I don't think they're going to like it. I don't think they are going to buy it a second time. And I think the ones who bought it the first time are going to slightly hate him for tricking them. Yeah. And also, you're just going to go, OK, you're mucking me around. You're mucking yeah, whatever, me around. Exactly. 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 OK, yeah. let's move on to Ziggy. Um, let's have a look at him referring to um, Charlie, who at the time had called him a pervert. He was very upset about it. And here he is in the diary. I just think it's best for me to leave now because. Uh, if my parents sat and heard that I was a pervert, they, they'd be, dis they'd be, I think, distraught. If something's said by Charlie like that, then I, God knows what will be said in the future. Ziggy, Big Brother does understand how you're feeling, and you Big Brother really. would you suggest don't, you don't understand. that you sleep on it. I don't think you guys have done anything about it, and you're not going to do anything about it, so that's, that's it. My feelings won't change. I'm afraid you'll be again. I'm very sorry. Two together. I'd be mad to go. Yeah. I'd be absolutely mad to go. But are they all going bonkers? Because, like, literally one minute, you're not going to do anything, and I've made up my mind, and that's yes. it, and then he's talked himself out of it. Yeah, yeah. What, it, it, what was it, happening there? It was never a genuine threat. It was a power display with respect to Big Brother. Right. The bare chest, forward yes, lean, bare chest. legs open. He tries to interrupt... Big Brother, there's a kind of interruption strategy there. And then as he's... Look at him, making, he's puffing out exactly, and Exactly, as he's making his implied threat, there's a kind of crotch adjustment, which was almost a crotch reveal at the very last minute. Crikey, let's have a look at that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's coming up, Davina, there it is there. But, Just in case you missed it earlier. Look, I, I, oh, look exactly. And, and, and this, but, is, this is a masculine display. It's a kind of symbolic, hyper-exaggerated masculine display. He, he might not be at the top of the male pecking order in the house, but he's trying to dominate Big Brother for one simple reason. He wants yeah. Big Brother to take action against Charlie. And he was quite lippy to Big Brother, wasn't he? Very well. he was lippy. Very quite rude That's part of it. That's his it's part of the display. The top. He's doing that whole, I could mug you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, listen, Natalie, you, in your opinion, right, he, he went in there and it quite obviously wasn't a genuine attempt to leave the house, so why did he do it? I think he's trying to manipulate Big Brother. I think he's also trying to manipulate us. I think what he's done there is realise he can't win against Charlie. And so he's come into the diary room to go, you get that I'm right, right, people at home. You get that she's right. irrational. Yes. Somebody right. should step he's in and, and stop her. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. He's not going in the house. He's trying to make it us. Allies, but we yes. can see right through him, cos we, we we've got through. you! <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, unfortunately. <laughs> Listen, I want to ask you both very, very quickly, um, you know, what, what do you think, I mean, that, what degree of success does anybody that leaves the house early have? Almost none, because yeah. as an audience, we're incredibly intolerant of it. You know, you're representative of it when you say it really annoys you when they go in and then start moaning and say they want to leave. A lot of people see it as being, you know, a huge achievement to have managed to get through all those auditions, to have gone through all that time. You know, there are people in that house who are 18, 19 years old. They've grown up with Big Brother. Yeah. When it was first on TV, they were literally children. Yeah. And suddenly to have somebody go, well, I'm not sure I want it anymore. I'm bored. You didn't think boring was going to be a <laughs> well, exactly. risk? I, I, it seems like too easy an option. It's almost as if they've gone in there for fame and they're going in there just for a few weeks just to grab that fame and then get out. 
the viewers, I think, want to see them go on a journey with them for several yeah. months. And not anybody just for a few that's weeks. left early, there's not one single person that's left early or been chucked out that has achieved the kind of celebrity that, that they, they would want. Not. Exactly. You were more exactly. likely to see Sandy personal shopping for you in Selfridges than ever on Heat magazine again. That was just the way it went. So thank you very, very much to Natalie and Geoffrey. Tonight, next week, more talk about housemates and how their brains work. Next on Ford, Big Brother. It's quite a good show. It's better than what's on the other side. Good night.